And I'm telling you, like, I've gotten some insane cool stories that are like, this person works hard. And then I've gotten some people that are I'm like, I'm interviewing oh. right now. I'm stealing that question <laughs> and using, I have an interview to immediately after this recording. I promise you, I'm going to ask that. The and turkey tell you and everything. Names. The turkey and everything. <laughs> I can wipe with some mashed potatoes off my face. Oh my God. <laughs> Here's what go-to-market teams are missing. Proof. That's what I think of every morning when I fire up LinkedIn and scroll through boring manifestos and endless lukewarm ticks because opinions are cheap and proof is gold. I'm Mark Huber and this is The Proof Point, a show from user evidence that helps go-to-market teams find new ideas, frameworks, and tactics that actually work today. Each episode includes an unfiltered discussion with the biggest names in B2B SaaS to help me find the proof points that I'm in search of. Hot takes, always welcome. On today's episode of The Proof Point, we've got three people who know a hell of a lot more about selling than I do and ever will, and they just schooled me. It was pretty incredible to get to learn from each and every one of them. We have Mark Casaglo. He's seen it all from his early outreach days all the way through his rise to the C-suite as Catalyst CRO. Next, we've got Rachel Shi. She's a super talented and no bullshit seller, my kind of people. And I'm incredibly lucky to have crossed paths with her at my last company. And she's changed how I see B2B sales for the better. And last but definitely not least, we have Nate Nasrella. He's leading the charge on enabling buyers and one of the most qualified people around to talk about this exact topic. Enjoy. My observation is that most reps out there kind of suck. And this isn't uh -oh. some comment on, you know, like just people in general. I think it's because of the way that we've been trained in this kind of little B2B SaaS vacuum that we're all in. I think this kind of like industrialized, like one size fits all sales training model that we've all kind of been funneled into, like Sandler inspired and spin selling inspired, like whatever, has led to people kind of being very coin operated, like say X and then Y is going to come out type of thing. And I think this is really noticeable when you're kind of on the outside of the table, like when you're being sold to, like it is extremely apparent that this is the case. And it's being enforced too by, you know, like sales leaders who don't even follow their own advice, which is kind of the, the craziest part, right? So that's kind of like my observation in terms of kind of what's wrong today. And I don't, don't think it has to be that way. Did you just accuse Nate of not writing compelling business cases when he's selling deals i think you did i think i heard that i i i heard it too i'm slightly offended however i guess this is kind of the point it's it's so i wasn't expecting rachel to start there but it's funny because i'm going to bring up i think i can screen share on this i'm going to bring up this text thread that i had with a friend fluent user so his name's matt can you guys see this yeah okay yeah. so he so we, we were having this conversation and he's, he's basically like, that's a really interesting observation. We're talking about, okay, let me go all the way down. Sorry, you're going to get the whole thread. He's like, I'm, I'm surprised by like just how lackluster most reps are. And he's like, do you think it's a leadership problem, a rep problem? And I'm like, I think 80% of it is a leadership thing because I think most reps want to do good work. They want to feel confident, but like, I think most people fundamentally are very mimetic, meaning they look for people to imitate and they haven't seen good leaders to study, observe, and like before the skills are there to mimic. And then he's like, okay, so, you know, tell me more about this. And I'm like, I'm working out my point of view as we're texting. I'm like, I think we're in like this generational cycle. Like, why, why don't we have good leaders? Well, they were once reps under leaders and they didn't have people to become like over time. And so we're just stuck in this like weird cycle of, I think when a good rep has a good leader early in their career to learn under, they go on to become a good leader. And then there's this whole generational effect that they leave in their wake. So that's kind of my take on the cause, which is actually kind of like a pretty wicked problem to break down if it's a generational thing. So I, I agree, Rachel, and my take on like what drives it is slightly different. So... It's funny, my first sales job, I worked at the worst named uh, shoe store on the planet. No joke, the name of the shoe store was The Athlete's Foot. Weird. But I had a, a manager there, I still remember her name, her name was Michelle McGee. I was 16 years old, and she made me sit in the back of the shoe store for, I think, eight hours and watch videos on a tiny little black and white TV, VHS, mind you, yes, I'm old. And... um 
what I learned in that sessions with her and then watching her was consultative selling and I didn't know it. I could literally watch how someone walked. I could look at their wear patterns on their shoes. I could tell basically, you know, a bunch of stuff just by watching and observing them and looking at their old shoes just and waiting for the punchline. <laughs> yeah, there's no punchline. The punchline is is by the end I had like two or three hundred people that would only buy their shoes from me as a guy in a mall just selling shoes at the athlete's foot. And so I, I learned consultative selling at 16 years old. Like it was all about looking at the situation, asking the questions that you need to ask and making sure that you don't have a preconceived solution in mind, but that you're open to whatever the customer needs, even if it's not in your store. And so I think, you know, I think I agree, Nate. I think that there's a lot of sellers that have grown up in the order taking SaaS economy and they're great order takers, but right now we need great sellers and there's just not many of those. Mark, when you were talking about just the first core skill of selling is listening and understanding where the person is coming from without any preconceived notion of like, what do I want to do or sell to them? What do they need? So some obscure knowledge. I've been reading this book, How to Know a Person by David Brooks. And in it, he introduces some research on this idea of empathic accuracy. Like what percent of what somebody else is thinking and feeling do you actually know? And can you get to know a person truly before making any type of recommendation or guidance and so on. And this is more in the context of just building a genuine relationship. You have to know somebody before you can figure out how to connect with them. Or in the world of sales, like you have to know somebody before you can prescribe any type of solution. Can you guys guess what the average level of empathic accuracy is? 27%. Okay, Mark. Are we playing Bryce's right rules? Um <laughs> Sure. Price is right rules. Okay. Price is right rules. Uh, no, I'm not going to go 1%. Uh, I'm going to go 7%. Okay. What about you, Rachel? Let's go in between 15%. Okay. Rachel wins because it's 20%. So Mark technically went over. However, a highly empathic person scores 35%. Meaning even somebody who is like deeply understanding still misses 65% of what's going on. And so like I, this visual that's in my mind is of like Mark sitting in a shoe store, watching somebody walk, noticing their gait and so on. And I'm like, that is such a rare skill for a seller to sit silently observing and absorbing information. Like how often is that a part of what they're seeing taught where we're just going to sit together, notice and observe deeply. Like that's, it's just not done. It's like, you know, reps are just brought up in a very different piece. And so what ends up happening is we miss 80% of what's actually going on in the deal. So kind I'm of interested. building off of that, one of the things that I, you know, I, you probably can't argue right now is just how much buying has evolved over the years. And especially within the last, you know, let's say four years plus, like, why do we think that selling hasn't evolved nearly as much? I mean, Nate, you mentioned it's like a generational problem. Well, I'm interested to know why. So Rachel is a, a great rep. Like what happened with you, Rachel? Like, did you have a great manager? Did you learn it yourself? Did, you know, did Nate share all his secrets with you over a burrito in San Francisco? <laughs> like what happened? Which we are going to tell the burrito story at some point, but yes, Rachel, I want to hear. Well, you know, great, great. very subjective, right? I think the, uh, you know, I am, I do err on the side of being good at listening and observing and pattern recognition and, and all those things, which I think predates my selling career. I, I think, uh, you know, I actually, I, I was a very introverted kid. You know, I was actually a, I went to school for design. So I was actually hoping to do something creative as a, a career. Couldn't figure out how to monetize like my drawings and sketches and that sort of thing, which I, I love. So ended up in, in sales and here I am. Um, but I do think that I guess skill that I developed of even like drawing people at the cafe or on a park bench or in a subway or whatever probably translated a little bit to what I do today, which is, you know, still observing people just in a, in a different way and understanding, you know, kind of like what things are behind the ask perhaps, right? Like going beyond the, the surface level. And I think this is something that I'm seeing as like a huge problem is this tendency for reps to just kind of take what's being said, like verbally, um, very much just at face value and then like answering like immediately based on that right because they're and it's, it's i don't know if like zoom culture or something has kind of contributed to this like everyone kind of feeling confined by this like 
30 minute discovery call where we have to get all these like 10 things and we have to dig for pain and, you know, understand like all these like med pick rules and things like that, which has, I think, kind of come at the expense of like a level of deeper understanding and, you know, the, the knowledge that you can always pick things, these things up along the way, right? Like your first call is really just to kind of establish some kind of a connection, um, establish if there's some kind of a pain and if there's a willingness to, to change is kind of my my thinking around it, right? So I think that mindset shift has really kind of yet to take hold in a lot of the sales training that's um, commonplace today. Rachel, when you were doing design stuff, was it pure just personal inspiration or were you working off of like a set of parameters that you were given or like the requirements of a client or a friend or somebody that you're doing stuff for? Uh, I mean, twofold, right? It would depend if it was a like more of a commercial engagement, in which case usually it was very not creative, right? It's like do this annual report or brochure or whatever based on these guidelines. Very boring. But the thing uh, that I actually found most interesting was like my illustration work, which was not for money. Like I posted it on my little Tumblr, uh, you know, back in the day. And that was really uh, my area of focus was like people. I just like drawing people, you know, some people like drawing buildings and other things. Like my thing was, was people and often like very like weird looking people, uh, like old people, like people with like really exaggerated features, overweight people, like whatever it may be. That was just fascinating to me. And that required like a lot of, you know, a, a deeper level of observation to really kind of capture those, those details. So yes, I'm inspired mm. by those people, but usually based on, you know, some kind of a reference point. Makes sense. Sounds like a good seller. Yeah. Have Make observations and get creative before? on solutioning. <laughs> Have you seen her drawings before or no? They're actually I'm wild. super it's curious impressive. now. <laughs> yeah, they're, like I've seen plenty of them. They're very impressive. All right. Anyone who's interested, check out my sub stack. It's linked to my LinkedIn. Makes no <laughs> money whatsoever. But uh, it's where I draw a lot of uh, the funny stuff that I see. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like yeah, the, 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 the it's, it's kind of humorous too, right? Like I like to draw funny. I, I like to laugh. I find a lot of things funny and I like to incorporate a lot of that into to my drawings as well. So I, w- I was going to ask you, Rachel, do you do commission pieces? We're, we're just moving into a new office space. So I'm like, hey, this could be like a great opportunity to get some, some good vibes in the office with what people see when they walk in. But your point on just kind of where you started, like from design to sales, I think part of Mark to your question of like, why has sales remained the way it has for a longer period of time as buying has evolved at a faster rate? I think part of it is there's not a, I guess, accurate impression from people outside of sales, what selling truly is, which leads to a lack of diversity and background and thought of people entering selling. And so for example, when I, like I never worked under a sales leader or went through a sales training program. Like some of my, my like best training ground to learn how to sell was building valuation models to value technology and IP and figuring out how do I quickly structure my thinking with a whole ton of information to return a really simple, precise answer to an executive. And like that was the best sales training in the world. I found a lot of analogies. And it's, it's like, you guys ever hear the stories of like Arnold Schwarzenegger taking ballet lessons to learn how to pose on stage mm. or like Kobe Bryant doing tap dancing to strengthen his ankles. It's like there are so many analogies that we can draw from other disciplines and bring into sales and get different points of view. And if people outside of sales have this perception of sales that's incorrect, then they're not going to be drawn toward the field to bring in new and fresh and different perspectives. And I think that is part of what is like created this – stasis in many ways in sales i uh so i like your the the hypothesis nate that there's like kind of maybe a a generational gap or an observational gap of past leaders that can help have have either of you or any of you read uh think fast and slow i have yeah amazing book i i'm not like you nate i can probably read like six or seven pages a day before my brain stops (laughs) i I probably can't cruise through it like you did in a couple days i need the bigger font in the books too like 100 page books like 16.5 yeah (laughs) yeah more diagrams please uh but in this book you know the the basic premise is there's system one and system two brain system one is lazy doesn't require glucose it's very reactional. The system two brain is analytical. It can do statistical analysis, but it's glucose heavy. And your brain is designed to just make you survive, not to like 
be a millionaire. It's just like make sure you find food, not eat at the you know, the eight hundred dollar a steak steakhouse, right? So um, system two brain likes to stay lazy. System one brain likes to have control, right? And so I think maybe what has happened is I've in my observations is that uh, sellers got really system one brain uh, adept in the time of order taking like, okay, I got this. And now system two thinks when I'm in a discovery call, just go in cruise mode, man, you got this. It's no big deal. Let system one brain, the stupid brain, take care of it. And you ask your stupid questions and you know, why did you take the call and that kind of stuff, which is not enlightening most, most of the time. And so I think that we've developed just a mental approach to sales that involves our lazy system one brain that's not very statistical, curious, or analytical. And we are, have to make sure that we're consciously engaging system two brain. We're having conversations that are asking people to make very difficult business decisions sometimes. I think a really practical test on that, like Mark, I love where you're going with it. And I'm thinking about how would I know, like what percent of my thinking during the day is system one versus two? How often am I switching between them? Like if you've got a full night's rest, you did no physical activity. How tired are you at the end of the day? Like if you were just spent despite a full night's rest to start and no, like you didn't go work out and stuff, but you were just like dog tired, you probably engaged and spent a lot of time drawing on system two during the day. Like it's tiring to use system two to your point. Do you think everyone can engage in system one, system two? And I was just going to ask that. Yeah. Like, is it possible? Like, how do you like get people to adopt that thinking? I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to get it wrong. Nate, help me here. But there's a one analogy in the book that is so convincing. I've probably done it a couple dozen times with people, but I haven't done it in a while. And it's, it's a simple question that shows you how powerful your system one brain is. Now, of course, we've preempted you and helped you understand like that this is kind of a trick question. So take that into account. But like, let's say that you have a baseball and a baseball bat. And together they cost one dollar and ten cents. The bat cost one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So what's your answer, Mark? I feel like this is a way too easy question that I'm gonna get wrong. So <laughs> I would say ten cents, but I know that's not the right answer. Rachel, you wanna take a stab? Oh my god. Uh it doesn't oh no i'm i'm getting confused now that would be too much wouldn't it be <laughs> that's right i'm on the wrong system <laughs> i think pr probably some listeners are like run that by me one more time yeah. and mark r r run it back one more time <laughs> yeah so sorry so the question is is you need to prepare us it's you have a much. you have a baseball and a baseball bat together they cost one dollar and ten cents the bat costs one dollar more than the ball how much does the ball cost and so let me break it down for you. So Mark, you said 10 cents. So if the ball is 10 well, cents. I said 10 cents and I know my answer is not the correct true, answer. But true, yes, you, you, you did qualify. <laughs> so uh, if the ball is 10 cents and the bat costs $1 more than the ball, that means the bat costs $1 and 10 cents. So together they're a dollar and 20 cents. So that answer is incorrect. The answer is 5 cents. If the ball is 5 cents and the bat's $1 and 5 cents, together they're a dollar and 10 cents. But that just shows you super simple, basic math question. But system one brain's like, yo, I got it. System two brain's like, I'm back on easy street. I'm not engaging. <laughs> system one brain says some stupid answer. But that's a perfect example. But if, the minute I explain it to you, your system one brain or system two brain's like, oh, I should have taken that. So yeah, Rachel, I think the answer is, is you can 100% engage your system two brain. You can think system two a lot of the time. But I think that you just have to be very conscious that system one brain wants to take over. Here's one other spin on it where system two thinking comes into play, but I don't think people spend nearly enough time on. A lot of people will realize, okay, math, hard thinking, I need to do some calculations. I need to put some numbers inside of a business case or whatever it might be, where I see a lot the difference between a really mature, a high-performing seller in a in a call it either a younger inexperienced or just like a lower performing seller of many years is their ability to navigate the social dynamics inside of a larger buying committee and inside of a complex deal a complex deal bigger contracts really isn't about the math that goes into making a million dollar or even a, a 100k investment work 
It's about aligning all of the different people's points of view, opinions, reputations that come into a deal. And most people, they, they can get the math right, but they get the drama in the deal wrong. And those are like the two types of problems that people will always sell into. You could solve the math problem. If you add in our search API, you can handle X number of requests to cut down your support tickets by Y and save Z dollars in support costs. They nail the math problem. And then they forget the second type of problem, which is the drama in the deal that prevents the math problem from actually being solved and going anywhere. And it takes a heck of a lot of system two brain work to try to understand all of the dynamics going on inside of the buying team. And you have to spend a ton of calories as a seller working those things out, bringing them out into the open, helping resolve and break them down. And that's where a lot of the nuanced thinking comes from. Hmm. Well, the math is the easy part. I mean, I'm not a seller. I'm not going to tell you how to sell, but I feel like the math is, you know, pretty straightforward. It's everything that you outline, Nate. So Rachel, like I've seen you do it well at metadata, like, how do you go about doing that? Doing the social dynamics? Not the math. Like not the math. The, oh, yeah. <laughs> not I've the seen math. your math is like just now. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, like the the politics and the, you know, basically reading the room, uh, especially when you're not in the room. And how do you, you know, help navigate that and help your buyer navigate that more importantly? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah, obviously different in every situation, but I think there's a couple of principles that you can kind of lean on, you know, which is, I mean, number one, like engage with everyone on an individual level. I think that's something that is really overlooked for some reason. I don't know. Like people seem to think like I'm selling to Acme. I'm not selling to these 10 people within Acme and all these group emails and group demos and all this stuff is just going to close the deal magically not taking into consideration all the, you know, the drama for Nate and dynamics that kind of go into it and sabotage that is happening um, behind the scenes. So I think as soon as you can, just try to build those one-on-one relationships. And if you can't, you know, it's not always possible to meet them in person, but do so, you can do so virtually, add them on LinkedIn, you know, personalize your outreach to them, personalize your follow-ups to them. Uh, it does take a little bit more time, but you're going to get to the truth a lot quicker. So that that's really critical. And then you know, also just leaning on your champion a lot. I think that's something also that kind of gets overlooked. You know, we talk a lot about champion building, like Nate's a king on this, but, you know, just sort of thinking about, you know, like asking them for this kind of advice, right? Like a lot of people like, okay, like they take the champions, like, cool, there's these five other people involved. We need to get them engaged, cool. Then the rep just goes and does their thing without kind of taking the time to like really use the resource that they have available in their champion who is inside the beast that they're trying to get into to like literally just tell them everything, right? Like this person's really technical. This person like doesn't really care. This person, you know, doesn't like the other person. All of that information is like right there. If you just ask the question, I think a lot of people just don't take that extra step and take time to ask, ask the question. So on the question front, and this is something that, you know, we're even working through here at user evidence too, is just, you know, how to go about discovery. And Mark, I know that you mentioned, I forget how recent this was, but you were talking about storytelling and the discovery process and using that as a way to help, you know, maybe awkward reps who don't know how to go about discovery a little bit. Like, help me better understand that because I loved what I read. Yeah. So I have a, the way that I like to open discovery is something I call a visual context question is to put someone into a visual state in their mind by telling a story that causes them to do some subconscious answering of questions that then I'm going to access later by asking real questions. So let me give you an example. So uh, Rachel, you know, let's say that you're in a room and you're waiting for your VP of sales to walk in. He or she walks in the conference room, picks up a red marker, writes two numbers on the board in red, breaks the marker at the putting an exclamation point after the last one and walks out pissed. Like, tell me the two numbers they wrote on the board. And so see what that does is one is everybody follow the story. Something happened in your mind. You listen, you, you put yourself in that room. You uh, subconsciously wrote something got written on the board, even though your conscious mind probably can't access it. And then when I ask you the question of what was written on the board, you give me a more truthful answer because your brain is lazy and it'll access the subconscious information and tell you what you saw. Right? So that is like a very easy way to start discovery 
that you then have to do a couple more steps to flush out actually what the real part is or problems are. But I really like starting discovery with like very visual mental image type of discovery questions like, Nate, you're sitting at, you're walking through the break room at the office and there's your three top rats and they're over there having a bitch session, man. You can't help it. You listen in a little bit. You're leaning over the microwave door trying to see what they're saying. Like, what's the first thing that you heard? <laughs> you know, stuff like that. It's just very different than like, hey, Nate, what are your three biggest problems that you're facing right now? Which as a buyer of tools is how most of my discovery calls uh, start. Boring. <laughs> Which is like, all right, we've done this. You've already lost my attention. I'm already not interested. So. They just put you in system uh, one brain, Mark. And now what you're going to do is you're going to spit out a bunch of rehearsed behavioral stuff to get off the phone because you know it's going to be boring. So are you teaching like that way of discovery to your team at Catalyst right now? Like, is everyone using that? I mean, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, most people use it. The only question, the next question though is how much do you dig? So to Rachel's point, like you got to keep asking questions, but if you do that, it can turn into interrogation. There has to be a point. There has to be like a treasure chest at the bottom of the hole. You don't just keep digging past the treasure chest. When the treasure chest is there, you stop. So that's the next thing is, is you, yeah, the first thing I do teach reps in discovery is how to start discovery in a pattern breaking way that gets people more involved and more interested. And then the second thing is, is how do you not make it an interrogation, but still ask the questions you need to figure things out that are important for the deal. So I'll, I'll add one other spin on this conversation. So a lot of the work that I think about, I do, I write about is building business cases, written content. And we're talking about conversations, live conversations. And the number one point that people come back to me on when they try building business cases for the first time is they're like, wow, my discovery is changing. I'm asking very different questions because I realized I don't have anything to write down because my discovery conversations were so shallow. <laughs> and in many ways, when you're asking the types of questions in the way that Mark is setting up, the fascinating thing is that many times your buyer has to stop and think about it because they've never asked themselves those questions either. And so if you're getting into this point of either, and this is a quick pressure test, like you'll know if you're going deep on the type of discovery Mark's talking about, if you can actually write out things like an effective problem statement. And when you are asking these types of questions, you'll probably notice that your sales conversations like slow down. There are more gaps and pauses. People need to take some time to think and they want to linger on a topic for a while. So like, what's the tempo of the conversation? And what's the depth of the, the written follow-up afterward? And like, man, what Mark is talking about is, is pretty, I mean, it's, it's pretty game-changing if you try it. And I'm calling this out because undoubtedly there are some people listening thinking like, that's great, Mark. It sounds like you can pull this off really well, but I'm me. I couldn't see myself doing it. And it's like, of course, find your own style, but try it. Like people will love you for it. People want these types of questions in their day. They want an enjoyable conversation. So I'd say, I'd say, give it a shot. Um, Rachel, do you have any favorite questions that you've been trying lately? Anything where it's been like, oh, this just got us to an interesting place. Well, I mean, before I answer that question, I want to kind of pee back of what you said, which is, you know, give things a try. I've given Nate's business cases a try. Like, you know, we've actually gone through some of them together and I can attest to the how powerful it is. Yeah, I took your course at uh, Chris Orlam course. That was where I first got introduced to it before you started to uh, oh, yeah. even release the book and all that. Yeah, and I've used it in a few of my deals and all of my prospects have really appreciated it, right? Because you're doing a lot of the work for them that frankly you should be doing. You're going to be this expert who's, you know, leading them to, to the solution and potentially, you know, it's, it's a big risk for them to, to take, right? So to put their neck out for you. So everyone check out Nate's stuff. <laughs> uh, in terms of questions, I think I like to, I mean, I like to disqualify early or more so kind of like polarize, uh, ask polarizing questions to, to do that. Uh, so for example, at Metadata, we're in a pretty interesting space where there's no kind of like direct one-to-one -one competitor for what it is that we do. It's on a CRM software or sales engagement software. So you really kind of have to position it correctly because even the website is amazing as it is, you know, Mark, uh, you know, uh, helps a lot with it. it. People still come in to that first call not really knowing what it is that we do because there's a lot there. So the, the usual paths, let's call it, in terms of like the decision that people typically make when 
choosing something like a media is like either hiring you know additional people or uh, hire an agency, right? Maybe a third, like just throwing more ad spend into the channels, paid media execution platform. So, you know, those are kind of the options, but people don't know those are even the options, right? People kind of see it and it's like, okay, but where does this fit in? Like, you know, how would this like look like in my day to day? So I think for me, I try to position a lot of that up front. Um, and that's changed a lot, even like, you know, in the way that I've sold, like I've changed my my approach so much, even in the, the two or so years that I've been here. And I found this to be sort of the, the most effective. And, you know, throughout the conversation, you know, as we kind of get deeper into discovery, I'll kind of sometimes just straight up ask them, you know, like, why not go with an agency instead, right? Or to hire additional you know, people, hire someone in-house to, to do this. Uh, and that'll kind of get them thinking too, uh, as to like, oh, like, you know, I've had really bad experiences with agencies or they have you really sort of even thought about that. But it's your goal is to get them thinking in the right direction. And if they, uh, you know, obviously are partial to that solution, like even you want to get that out um, as quickly as you, you can too. So not being afraid to ask questions that could put your solution as the, the lesser preferred one. Mark H, can I jump on uh, in with another question here? Cause yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You were okay. Yeah. Two books. That you already had a third book idea at the beginning of this. You know way more about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I, I want to link part of Rachel, what you were saying is like, I'm asking questions to intentionally disqualify people. Earlier, we were talking about this idea of like the generational dysfunction that exists in sales. So Mark, when you are asking some discovery questions in an interview, and you're trying to disqualify a candidate or say, hey, this is the type of person that we want on the team. What are some of those like high signal questions that you're bringing up in an interview? to figure out, okay, is this somebody we want to disqualify or continue on with? So most of my interview questions are not actual questions. They're, I want to see you in action. So for example, like my favorite thing that I do in an interview is I think I can 100% accuracy tell if somebody's coachable or not. And that to me is like the number one thing that I need in my sales culture is coachability because it says I want to learn and I've, when my sales organizations are addicted to learning, we crush. When everybody just wants to do their own thing, we just kind of stagnate. And so, uh, so for coaching, what I do is I do something really simple. I would say like something like, hey, Rachel, what's the number one objection you get at metadata? Like the number one thing that people say like they don't want to use you. What is it? Usually it can be something like, you know, my like, VP marketing isn't bought into the yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So what I would do then is I would say, all right, Rachel, let's do a quick role play if you're cool. And now this is the first thing is when I do that, I get a nonverbal and the nonverbal is usually this. And that means I'm resistant and I don't like role plays, which are a key component of coaching. So I'm looking for the nonverbal. Some people are like, oh yeah. And they like kind of lean in because they're really ready. Right. And I say, all right, how did, would you overcome that objection? Let's role play it real quick. So, hey, you know, Rachel, I love metadata. You're awesome. You did a great job. You know what? My VP just isn't getting it. Like, we're not going to continue. Like, we're going to actually pick one of your competitors. Sorry about that. You know, and then Rachel says whatever she says. And now what I would do is I say, hey, Rachel, that was really good. But could I give you a little coaching? And that's my second nonverbal is what do they do when I propose coaching to a, from a stranger, right? Again, the... What I'm looking for in the best case scenario is like somebody grabs up their little moleskin and gets a pen and like ready to take notes. I've had that happen a lot. Other people like, you know, you can tell through their reluctance that they aren't interested in it. And so then I say, okay, here's the, um, here's what I would say, Rachel, you know what you did is you just overcame the objection. You didn't ask a question to clarify what my real objection is. Don't forget most objections are knee jerk responses. They're not actual objections. Always ask a clarifying question to make sure it's an actual objection, not a knee jerk response. So would you mind like if we redid the role play, I'd love to see like if you can, if I my coaching is any good, like can you do it? Then I make to redo the role play. And I don't care if they get it right. What I care is they try. As long as they try, they're coachable and they want them on my squad, right? But when they don't try, when they just revert back to the way they know because they can't help it because it's too big of a gravity well, their own behavior that they can't get out of it, that's not that's not a seller for me, even though they may be a great seller, but that's not a kind of person I want to add to my sales culture. Fascinating. So it's more behavior based. It's not a response. It's like, let me look and see how you're interacting in this moment all, and then all geared toward coachability. Yeah. And like work ethic is another one. I think you got to grind in sales like, you know, and so my question for work ethic typically is like, listen, you're sitting around on Thanksgiving 
and I'm a guest at your house and I'm about to eat turkey. And before I put in a big old bite of a drumstick, I say, hey, tell me a crazy story about how hard Nate works. What's the story your grandma tells me? And I'm telling you, like, I've gotten some insane cool stories that are like, this person works hard. And then I've gotten some people that are I'm like, I'm interviewing oh. right now. I'm stealing that question <laughs> and using, I have an interview to immediately after this recording. I promise you, I'm going to ask that the and I'll tell you all The turkey and everything. <laughs> I am wiping some mashed potatoes off my face. Oh my God. <laughs> so I'm going to put you on the spot, Mark. What, if you can think back to how many times that you've asked that question, what is the uh, best answer that you've ever? Simple. Received. A young man came to me and he goes, you know what? My dad grew up in Eastern Europe and he was a farmer. We immigrated, he immigrated to Chicago and he spent his entire life buying the lot that our house was on and the two lots next to it. He tore down those houses and he built a farm like in downtown Chicago and he made me work it every single day. And I had to get up at 4 a.m. before school, 4 a.m. on the weekends, and I tended the farm in downtown and he would pay me. But when I got a little older and I was a teenager, I went to my dad and I was like, yo, dad, you know, I don't need the money. I want to go hang out with my friends. And my dad said to me, you know what, son, you're going to still stay, but I'm just not going to pay you now because you're just not getting what this is all about. And he's like, I, and he's like, it opened my eyes at what it meant to my dad, what it meant to my family, like the tradition, the hard work. And he, and he kind of went through this, like that kind of a story. And I was like, oh my God, this kid really appreciates and understands what work is about and why it's beneficial to you. And, you know, um, we, we hired him up. I have a couple other crazy stories of questions like that, but that one will, I'll never forget because he was just so passionate about the lesson he learned by telling his dad, nah, I don't really want to do this. And his dad drew him back in and then he loved, ended up loving the work. I've, I, I've got one not quite as good as that, because that is a pretty legendary story to hear back. Part of our application process when you're applying for a job is instead of a cover letter, you write two, two um, questions or two answers to two questions in your email. The first is, what is a uh, opinion that you hold very strongly that most people disagree with? And then the second question is, what is a hobby or project you're working on on nights and weekends? Mm. And part of the reason why we asked that second one is because we kind of very much live in this like, side hustle culture where you do things to make money on the side, not because you just love to learn what it is. And so like when I, you know, clock out, I'm going to work on something else just because I love the learning that it affords me. So one guy wrote a very interesting response that was around this idea of like um, gargoyles and World of Warcraft and so on. And so I'm in, I'm in the interview and I'm asking him, like, tell me about these gargoyles. And he turns back and he has this like big shelf behind a curtain behind him and he pulls this curtain back. And then there are all of these figurines. Some were 3D printed, some were handmade, some were fired in a kiln of like all these different things. And he could tell me points of like the different um, cooking temperatures of different types of plastics, how that varies based on the additives. All of these like just very obscure knowledge. And when he said that, like he came alive he, he like it's it's not like this is making him six figures a year on the side and therefore it's like he just loves this mm -hmm. stuff and it's like that's the people i like being around when they are weirdly passionate about obscure things just for the sake of learning about them you kind of want to be like that a little bit more so when you can put them all together inside of one room there's something special i think that happens there so the gargoyle story love it <laughs> uh Mark, I'm also trying to think of in my head, uh, since I'm in Chicago right now and I've grown up in the city, uh, where that <laughs> farm is and it's going to kill me. I'm going to like, I'm on a mission tonight to like figure out where this is. I'll find it this weekend. <laughs> Urban farm of Chicago is somewhere lurking around a corner. Yeah, that'd be the last place I'd ever imagine a, a farm to be, downtown Chicago. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're talking to... Uh, the what would be a i guess the fourth generation of uh, a family woodworking business that uh clearly is interviewing you all on a podcast right now so <laughs> i don't work as a family, family woodworking business um and it's funny and i've shared this with other people before but in my head you know when i was at college and you know about to tell my dad that hey i wanted to do something else because i always wanted to do something else i respect the family business and i think it's really cool but I thought it was going to be this huge conversation that I was just letting them down. And 
my dad could see, you know, little 22 year old Mark really nervous. It just a very heavy conversation. I was probably 20 seconds in and he stopped me because he knew exactly where I was going. He goes, Mark, We've known since you were five years old, you didn't have a handy bone in your body. Like we knew you were going to do something else. Like it's totally fine. Savage. <laughs> um, but one of the things, you know, just to kind of bring it back on the rails as much as I love all of this and what we've talked about, just like shaping conversations, especially, you know, Nate, with the book that you've written and I can't wait to read it, just shaping conversations when you're not in the room, like how do you even think about that? How do you approach that? Because that's the name of the game for selling this year. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So I was talking, catching up with an account executive, Gabe. He sells in also, Rachel sells into marketing teams. And he was trying this process of developing a business case for the very first time. And so I was asking him, hey, what have you found about shaping internal buying conversations when you're not there by creating and co-creating written content almost as a script to guide your champion? And he was like, well, it was fascinating as I was talking with Adrian, who was my champion in the deal. Um, he got, he in like record time shave, he has consistently been shaving 50 days off his sales cycle through the process of creating business cases. And so he's been going back and asking his champions like, hey, what do you think? Should I continue to do this with other customers? And Adrian said to Gabe, you know, what was interesting, I was expecting to need to rely on the content more in my conversations, what I actually found is because we created this together, I had internalized the exact message that I wanted to deliver to my CMO. And so I sent it as a pre-read, but in the conversation, I was crisp and I was on point because it was the writing process itself, not necessarily the output that I found the most value in. Hmm. So while you are producing this document, this artifact that you can socialize, you can share, it's a pre-read, so on, Adrian's point, the champion in the deal, was like, I internalized this. It was the, the, the writing process itself. And I think that is something that um, mo most people will realize is when you go into the process of clarifying a written document, you in and of itself, you are like running an enablement program for your buyers. Like you, the people listening to this podcast are probably selling professionally. Like Rachel, they may be taking courses. They may be listening to other podcasts. Buyers don't do that. Like they're not studying the art of messaging and selling a deal <laughs> internally. And so it's like, that's not their day job, right? And like buyer is not a professional title <laughs> or label. It's not part of the thing that they do. So it's a cushy job if that was a real job, but yes. <laughs> totally, totally. That's right. Sit around and buy tools. <laughs> so what I would say is like your buyer enablement program is like a single page of content. If you can create that with the buyer, you are doing your job to transfer some of the skills that you're learning, your ability to crisply communicate the product of all of this this discovery to an executive you're giving them that ability you're enabling them nate's changing the entire game this is a like an inflection point in history i'm telling you like mark h like i know you're not as much in the sales world side of things but this guy's gonna be huge i mean it's exactly why i wanted this crew to talk about this topic i mean it, like nate the way that you just talk about this it makes too much sense it's almost like why aren't more people doing this? it's like one of those you're too like, smart just, you're oh, too hands are so obvious <laughs> like why aren't you like why isn't everyone doing this like i notice just as like the buyer when i go through processes of evaluating tools i don't think i've worked with a rep that has probably done exactly what your book outlines and how you approach things but even reps that are closer to that than not I immediately give a shit about working with them and like making this work because I can tell that they truly care about like me and getting this done, not just in a transactional kind of way. So we're, we're finishing, finishing up some research on this. We have a little over 200 orgs that we've um, taken in data from on average, less than 10% of deals have a documented business case for the deals and pipeline. And so to your question is like, why isn't, to put some numbers on why aren't people doing this, like less than 10% of deals actually have a documented business case. One of the core reasons in like Rachel, I'll tag you in here is like, I never promised somebody that it's easier, only that it's worth it, but it's not, it's not an easier way to sell. It doesn't require less effort. So Rachel, when you were going through the process of building your first business cases with your champions, like what, what was it like? What level of effort, intention, maybe just like the first time through it? Mm -hmm. 
how did you find it? Well, it was like just an entirely new muscle, right? Like the way that we'd been building business cases before, as you know, is kind of just like a product centric deck, maybe three bullet points, what we think their issue is and neatly how our solution kind of solves all three of those right now they're going to get a 10x ROI like that is just you know stock standard uh, this is the world that we live in so uh, Nate's approach is a lot more cerebral it's a lot more in-depth um, it looks like an internal document that they have it's just like a one pager and it kind of highlights a couple of things highlights sort of you know the problem statement you know, kind of what the implications of that problem are to the business post solution, your, your solution and, you know, some like rough, maybe ROI calculations and then sort of next steps and what we need to do to get, get everyone on board. So yeah, it's just a lot uh, more depth. And I think what I really like about Nate's approach is like beyond the, you know, kind of just a different way of doing things is using the, the, the concept of using the buyer's language, um, which is something that is not done at all when we're using our own kind of branded material it's just it's a different frame of mind that you're in so when we're kind of doing this like very blank slate type of approach just a plain old document and we're kind of in uh, not only yet using language that we're kind of learning from the buyer in the process but we're actually inviting them into that document um doing things just simply like tagging them like hey like you know this is what i think we're doing here like are these numbers accurate you know how would you you describe this sort of thing uh, and that then lets them uh, like actually meaningfully contribute to to that that document, that business case. So yeah, I think for me, like in one specific scenario, uh, like it, it led to me learning the specific deal that I was working was attached to an overall initiative, like you know, efficiency twenty twenty four, like cheese something cheesy that you know their leadership was telling them, you know, as it pertained to their their marketing initiatives. But it, like it made a difference, and it just like literally just made it the headline of my my business case right metadata was just kind of like a natural like piece of the, the solution there's that one the there's one practice in there that rachel's calling out that is like hugely impactful that if you take nothing else away you just try this throw out the whole business case thing for a second just do this you will get better and then you can introduce the whole business case after is finding those like internal code names and phrases in the buyer's language it's like a mental shortcut that signals to the executive you understand or, and are aligned with what they're already sold on. And there was there, I came across Mark, something you wrote. I can't remember when, but you were referencing like years ago at outreach, you guys had this thing called what TMOD, T-Mod. T-Mod? Yep. is that how you guys would T-Mod. say it? T-Mod. What, what was T-Mod all about? T-Mod was uh, 10 million or die. We needed to go from two and a half to 10 million bucks. And if we did, we were going to take the whole company on a trip to Cabo. And uh, we put four months of, one meeting a week at 6 a.m. where every single department head got together and talked about what their department was doing to get us to 10 million bucks. And we forexed our growth. It was one of the most memorable parts of my entire career. Now, if you saw like three emails in your inbox with docs attached, one said, <laughs> you know, 10x revenue. One said 30% more pipeline. The next one just said T-Mod. Which one are you going for? T-Mod, baby. That's a shortcut. You just if you can find those code names, it is like literal gold, literal gold. Mm. And I remember seeing Rachel. It's funny we've never talked about this before, but I remember seeing one of the first business cases that you know you had worked on at Metadata, and you shared it with me. And we had just gone through this big positioning and messaging like update, and I saw it, and I was like, I don't even have the time to try and correct her on this. I'm going to go work on other things. But like, I wish she was using the language that we had just rolled out. Now it makes total sense why you ignored what I did because it was 100% by design and it works, more importantly. <laughs> Which business case was this? I don't know. There's too many that I saw. But yeah, I like. I was pissed at first and I kept it to myself until this podcast recording. I was like, God damn it. Why can't she just use what I rolled out? But it makes total sense now because you're using their language. Oh, the right. The slide garden and yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I don't use what marketing produces. <laughs> You guys are very detached from the the customer. It's, it's pretty, you know, you can use pieces of it, but at the end, it's not going to get a deal done. So That's hilarious. All right. So we've got a couple minutes left. We made it all the way through without talking about this, but the fact that I had all three of you on the same episode was 100% intentional because there was a little story that happened, uh, eating burritos. And I think you were, where was this? It was at, was it Saster? This this was Saster, San Mateo, California. <laughs> All right, <laughs> who's taking it away? Because I got to hear this story. 
don't know if it's a great story, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just how we all got together. It was, uh, I mean, we just kind of deviated from the pack a little bit. Just you were at some a, a real dinner person. or event or something, and then we just said, hey. This is a good story. This is exactly what I would do. You're like burned out. You just want some downtime and burrito. Yeah, Nate's like, there's a dope burrito place down here. And Rachel and I were like, yes. <laughs> and Nate's like, I'm buying. And I was like, double yes. <laughs> and then uh, and I will tell you, the burritos were like bigger than your forearm. <laughs> they were amazing. What we have to decide here, though, burrito burrito clan, is does Mark replace John as the fourth burrito person? Oh, we actually had a fifth person. I think one of your a D. Yeah, yeah it's my other uh, my colleague, my GM. Oh, you guys met a D. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so you could slide oh, in yeah. as number four or five, Mark. You know, we'll see how it goes. But you know, it's under advisement uh, from the council here. If tryouts are open, I'll be at Saster, I think, this year. So we'll have to uh, – <laughs> I'll get a one burrito tryout and see if I can hold my own. Okay. Well, Mark, waiting in your inbox is a Chipotle gift card. So if you can film yourself putting down two Chipotle burritos, you are officially <laughs> – oh, <laughs> oh, my God. This is amazing. Uh, we are just at time. I learned so much here. This was even better than I thought that it was going to be. And uh, even better, Mark, I get to use an interview trick uh, in about – five minutes that I was not planning on stealing from you, but I'll let you know how it goes. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. This was great. We appreciate you. Thanks, Mark. Of course. Thanks for having us.